Good morning, Turning Point. I love the every week. Woo! Look at somebody and say, woo! All right. Man, I was sitting over there in, in worship, and I went to the back. I was like, this is one of those Sundays I felt the Spirit of God so strong uh, that we could just keep on, keep on worshiping, man. And I commend Bryce for leading such a great team and um, just tapping into the presence of God and leading us into that. So I'm thankful for Bryce and our team. I know that you are. I know you clapped for him earlier, but let's give it up for him. Because what people don't know is it's not just about getting a set list and making sure you know all the chords and all the words and uh, all those wonderful things. It's really about um, Bryce and his leadership seeking the presence of God throughout the week and uh, reading his word and spending that relationship with him. And I believe that it's showing here. I believe that lives are being changed just in worship. And so, uh, for sure. And so, thank you for that, Bryce. Uh, today, I'm going to preach to you a, a sermon. This is probably, is it up there? The longest sermon title I've ever had. <laughs> it's pretty long. I got one laugh. We're going to make it. Um, you don't know how much these holes cost me. I would say turn to your neighbor and say that because I like to do that kind of stuff, but that would take you four minutes. And so uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, but I really feel I, I've been preaching the last uh, three, uh, two sermons, and this is the third now. Um, if I don't make it through this sermon, I really this has been weighing on my heart for people uh, this whole series. I didn't realize it would be a series, so I didn't make a series name, but it's turned into one. Uh, I just want people to know that God is for you. Um, God loves you. God has given his son Jesus because of you. And so I didn't intend this to be a series, but I've been talking about how we cast our cares on God and how he gives us a way out of temptations. Um, I used the Jenga thing. We talked about that again last week. Um, and I just know that there are people that need to know that God wants to help you. God wants to be with you. God wants to work in you. And so I want to talk about, uh, you don't know how much these holes cost me. And uh, we're really talking about this, the sacrifice that Jesus made. And uh, there's a couple of different things I want to talk about in this sermon uh, today. Uh, it's going to be a little bit about um, your value in Christ, a little, maybe a tad bit on worship. Uh, so bear with me, maybe a tad bit on forgiveness or a lot on forgiveness and a little bit about the sins that we carry in our lives. And so uh, before we get going and into our scriptures today, I have a lot. So if you didn't get your Bible reading in this week, I'm going to give it all to you today. Um, and so I want to pray, and I believe that God is going to touch your life today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your presence in this place. Lord, I know that you're here. I know that you're here for us. I know that you came for us. I know that your sacrifice is for us, that you want to be close to us, that you long to work in us and through us. Lord, to help us, to guide us, and to lead us. And so, Father, today I ask that uh, I would decrease and you would increase. And let this be about you, Father, and that lives would be changed because of your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, I want to read to you in, in Hebrews. I have two passages. The first one is Hebrews 9, 24 through 28. And I'm reading from the message version. I know a lot of people don't like it. I like the message version sometimes because it's pretty real in your face. And so I like how uh, God, I don't know if y'all got the message version back there. Did y'all get it? They got it? Yeah. All right. Uh, and so, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little pumped up. Uh, but it's really cool how uh, this, this version kind of depicts and puts it in our, kind of our, our understanding. And so I want to read here in verse 24 of Hebrews 9. And go through 28 it says this for Christ didn't enter the earthly version of the holy place he entered the place itself and offered himself to God as the sacrifice for our sins there's a lot of places I want to just clap we can just put the mic down take it off and go home um, that's one of them he entered this place himself to offer the sacrifice for whose sin come on now whose sin our sin y'all don't want to eat early today he doesn't do this every year as the high priest did under the old plan with the blood that was not their own. If that had been the case, he would have to sacrifice himself repeatedly throughout the course of history. But instead, this is another place we could probably get excited, he sacrificed himself once and for all, summing up all the other sacrifices in this sacrifice himself, the final solution of sin. Everyone has to die once, then face consequences. Christ's death was also a one-time event, but it was a sacrifice that took care of sins forever. 
And so, when he next appears, the outcome for those eager to greet him. Anybody eager to greet Jesus? This is the outcome for those eager to greet him is precisely salvation. That's good news. My next passage is John uh, chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. And this is what we're going to talk about a lot here today. It says this. It's a pretty familiar story. But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve, this is a twelve disciple, was not with them when Jesus came. And this is right after Jesus was resurrected after three days being in the grave. So Thomas was not with the twelve when Jesus first came. Then the other disciples told Thomas, we saw the master. But Thomas said, unless I see the nails holes in his hands and put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side. Pretty brutal, huh? That's why I like the message. I won't believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time Thomas was with them, and Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. And then he focused his attention on Thomas. How intimidating could that be? You ever been sitting in church and be like, they're preaching right to me. It's God focusing his attention on you. And he says to Thomas, take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it into my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. And Thomas said, my master, my God. And Jesus said, so you believe because you've seen with your eyes. But even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. You don't know how much these holes cost me. I have this secret hope one day to be on a game show. Anybody ever have a secret hope in your life? Don't judge me. Anybody have a secret hope? We just read this beautiful scripture and I went into game show. You're like, what? Like, I don't want to just be like a judge on the game show. I want to be a contestant. Like, since I was little, I want to be a contestant. Like, I, I wouldn't mind being on Wheel of Fortune. Any Wheel of Fortune people out there? Woo! I'm showing my age a little bit. I wouldn't mind being on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Anybody want to be a millionaire out there? Come on, can I get an amen? Mm-hmm. But there's this one game show that I grew up watching. I've watched it with my mom when I was young, and I loved it. The Price is Right. <laughs> like, when I was growing up, the host was Bob Barker. Like, there wasn't one person on TV that had more swag than Bob Barker. He had that slick back white hair. He had suits that nobody ever wore. He had that long, skinny microphone for some reason. Like, I loved me some Bob Barker when I was growing up, and I would love to watch this show all the time with my mom. And I would, I'd be on there like, I can do this. I can win. I can guess the right price. And, and, and the only issue for me was is I always would seem to bet too high or too low. And it would always be that person be like, I bet one dollar. Ooh, you know. Like I would never get the value of something correct. Like I would go too high or too low. And I started to think in my life, I think in a lot of ways this is how I was in life. Like how many times have we undervalued our worth in Christ? How many times have I under, undervalued my worth in Christ? And my simple prayer today is that you would be able to see and realize your worth in Jesus. You need to know this today. You're more valuable than you know, and you cost a lot more than you realize. Come on, you're more valuable than you know, and you cost a lot more than you realize. I remember growing up, and I still do it sometimes. Shane makes fun of me for my skinny jeans, but it's okay. I have style. I'm not implying that he doesn't. I'm just... He's got a better beard than me and hair. But I, I used to grow up and I'd buy these, when I was young, living, I'd buy those jeans with holes all in them. Y'all know those? And my dad would get so irritated. He's like, son, I can make you some of those jeans. I'll give you some of my work jeans. They're already dirty. I can just cut some holes in them. And he would, he would make fun of those jeans and I'd be like, dad, I paid this much money for these pants. And he'd always say, I can buy four pairs of pants for that. You bought them pants, all them holes in them, and I would get so irritated because he didn't realize how much those holes in those jeans cost me. Lots of money. And I've done this a ton myself, like I judge the worth of something by how it looks in the moment. 
I judge the worth of the season that I'm in, and if we're not careful, we can look at Jesus and his death and truly not understand or realize all that he went through to offer us salvation. We do this many times by doubting what he says. And we hear the word, but we don't accept it for ourselves. You ever been there? Like, I can pray for somebody, I can believe for somebody, but when that happens to you, you're like, oh, God, be honest. I'm preaching to myself this morning, too, so I'm right there with you. And this is what bothers me so much when I read the text uh, in John. I look at Thomas and I say to myself this, I say, Thomas, why were you so quick to doubt? Why were you so quick to question, weren't you there? Didn't you talk with Jesus? Didn't you walk with Jesus? Didn't you hear him talk about what was going to happen in his life? Didn't you learn or hear the prophets of old saying that he had to die and one day return? Weren't you there with him when he was crucified on the cross, when they were putting the nails in his hands and in his feet, and the people were mocking him? Wasn't that enough confirmation, Thomas, to let you know that everything he said was true? Why weren't his words enough? Thomas. But before we pick on Thomas, how many times have we heard a verse or a word or we post something on social media hoping that it will encourage someone else, but we really don't accept it for ourselves? If I'm preaching to anybody this morning, I'm preaching to myself. So many times we feel like quitting and we think that life is often too hard to make it through. Then I realized the Bible says that we're more than conquerors. I mean, this is, this is why sometimes we hear verses and sermons and oftentimes don't accept them over our, ourselves is because when seasons get bad, we don't feel like more than a conqueror. Why isn't the word enough for us? Before we hate on Thomas, we have to realize that we're also dealing with DTS, Doubting Thomas Syndrome. I know I'm weird, but it's true. We hear verses, we come to church, we can even be preaching the sermon. We worship, but we have all these insecurities built up on the inside that control us. And every time that we doubt that he loves us, and every time that we doubt that he can forgive us, and every time that we doubt that he can use us, we're no different than Thomas, but in fact, we're suffering from the same thing that he did. Look, Thomas walked with Jesus. How incredible. He heard all the words. He went to all the conferences. He, he downloaded all the sermons. He listened to them, yet the words were not enough for him. I feel like this is how we are sometimes with some of the sin that we face in our lives. It's too big for God to forgive. I guess this is just who I'll be. I de I'll deal with this for the rest of my life. Uh, I, I, I don't know if forgiveness can be for me. Someone needs to know that the moment you ask for forgiveness, that sin was taken away from you. The moment you ask for forgiveness, that sin was taken away from you. The sin you dealt with a year ago, the mistake you made three years ago, the, the mistakes or the problems that you're dealing with now. See, some of you came in here looking like dead men walking. It's true. And you're hoping that in some way, somehow, you'll be forgiven or maybe you'll have a chance to give your life to Christ and be saved. And for some reason in your mind, you think that that is too big for Jesus to forgive you. But you have to get a true understanding of Jesus because a true understanding of the depths of Jesus will liberate you or free you from the weight of your sin. I remember, I'm more excited than you this morning. There's no doubt about it. I remember I would, went on this church trip and when I was young, and we would travel, and we called it tour. We would travel and go do these performances. It was a two-week tour, and one of my friends, he, he didn't have a luggage because it broke when he was trying to pack, and so his grandma was like, hey, I have some for you, and he was like, all right, sweet. But when he got there, it was fuchsia and flowery, <laughs> and he had no choice, and so we gave him a hard time about this. Every place we stop, it's a two-week tour, right? We're going to churches, host families' houses, hotels, all these things on this tour bus. And every time we would, we would open that bus and get all the luggage out because all the guys had to do it, we'd see, it just stood out. Like, we saw it. There it is. And we'd give him a hard time. Hey, I'm not going to say his name because he might be watching, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. Will, here's your, here's your, if you're watching, I love you. 
He probably still has pictures of this. Here's your fuchsia and flower. We'd make a big deal. Like, like, who's is this? Must be a girl's. And he's like, for real? Just crazy stuff. And everywhere he went in dragging this luggage, you could notice him. You could see him. Like, there he is. Where'd Will go? Right there. Pink and fuchsia flowers. Like, right there. We got it. And everywhere he went, he had this luggage and he was carrying it. But the thing that bothered him one day, he told me, and we were just kind of joking about it, the most that bothered him is that he knew that this luggage didn't belong to him, but people were looking at him walking around with it. And you could spot him a mile away. Like, there he is. I wonder how many of us are walking around with luggage. I wonder if we even packed it, maybe we even bought it ourselves. And we're walking around with luggage that isn't ours. Please understand the moment that you gave your life to Jesus, that luggage no longer belongs to you. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. The Bible tells us to cast it upon the Lord. Look, I've been talking about this this topic because I, I think people need freedom from the weight that they deal with, the sin, the worry, the doubt that they deal with in their life, but yet we're walking around with something that doesn't even belong to us and it's causing us to devalue our worth in Christ. Look, I pray that someone leaves some luggage behind this morning. I pray that someone lays at the feet of Jesus the doubt, the sin, the hurt, the pain, the anxiety at the feet of Jesus this morning. Oh, pastor, this is a good sermon. But I sort of, you know, I kind of understand. But you don't understand that what I've dealt with for so many years is so big. And God really... I don't know, I think, I think he's just teaching me a lesson. It's keeping me on path. I, I, you know, he can't forgive me. But every time you doubt that God can forgive you, you discredit what he did for you on the cross. Those of us that walk around in guilt, those of us that walk around in shame, those of us maybe we've become complacent, those of us that may have forgot, those of us that think life is supposed to be just skipping through the daisies with Jesus and it's supposed to feel good all the time. Look, life is hard sometimes. Can anybody attest? We, experiencing, we experience challenging seasons sometimes. I got news for you. Jesus never promised that it would always feel good. What he did promise is that he will never leave us nor forsake us, that he would always be with us. But yet we seem to just carry around this sin and this luggage and this baggage because of a feeling. But if you're doing that, you don't realize how much these holes cost him. Because he did not go through what he went through so that you could feel good for a moment. He went through what he went through so that you can experience freedom from sin for a lifetime. That sin doesn't belong to you. That pain doesn't belong to you. That issue doesn't belong to you. It's not yours. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. You should be excited about that. You are forgiven. Look at somebody and say, you are forgiven. Come on, you got to help me out. You are forgiven. But this is the question, but why do I still feel this conviction if I repented? If I ask for forgiveness, why do I still feel this conviction? You don't. That's guilt. That's guilt. Conviction is what you feel before you repent. Guilt is what hangs around after you repent. They may seem the same. They may feel the same, but they're totally different. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit, which leads us to repentance. Guilt is from Satan because he tries to get in your mind and make you think that God hasn't forgiven you. And oftentimes, God has forgiven us because the moment we ask for forgiveness, he says, here it is. You have forgiveness. It's free to you. He's already paid the price, and he gives it to you. But oftentimes we walk through life and we pick up. The devil says, here's guilt. You're not forgiven. And we pick up, it our, we pick up that luggage ourselves, and we begin to weigh our own selves down. And then we want to blame that stupid devil. It's really us. You are forgiven. Guilt is from Satan. If you repented, you are forgiven. But catch this, we often miss this, and I won't get too far off into this today. I'm going to dig deeper into this another time. But the Bible says that we must repent, but then turn from those ways. We miss that sometimes. Repent and turn from those ways. Maybe you feel guilt and shame, and, and you feel broken because you didn't know that you had to turn. 
Maybe you, you feel all this problem in your life because you didn't realize I had to turn, or maybe you realize it and you didn't turn from that. See, true repentance is asking for forgiveness and then turning away from those things that held you down. That's true repentance. There's a story in the Bible about a man named Zacchaeus. Anybody ever heard of Zacchaeus? He was a tax collector. He was corrupt. He, he taxed people uh, an outrageous amount of money, and he got away with it. He robbed people, and no one would tell him anything. They were kind of afraid of him. They knew who he was. They knew his stature. People sort of feared him. He had, he had a lot of Twitter followers probably, and so they didn't want to make a tweet and get upset and get banned from Facebook. So people feared Zacchaeus. But one day, he hears that Jesus is coming and he's going to be preaching in this town. And so he wanted to see what, what Jesus was all about. And so because he was this man of short stature, uh, he climbed up in this tree. Some people believe it's a sycamore tree. And he climbed up this tree to see Jesus. But before Jesus ever preaches, he, he walks up to that tree and he calls for Zacchaeus to come down. He says, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to go eat dinner at your house. Could you imagine his face? What? You ever been unprepared and somebody comes over and you're like, oh, <laughs> hey. You ever have that friend that just invites themselves over and they just open your refrigerator and eat all your ham and cheese and you don't have sandwich meat left for lunch? They just feel at home and they eat all your snacks? Jesus invited himself over to Zacchaeus' house, and, and they get there, and I can imagine, or this is just me, okay? Just, just hang with me because this is how my brain works. I can just imagine what was going on through the mind of Zacchaeus while Jesus is in his house. He's probably thinking, why would this man want to be here with me? Doesn't he know that I rob people, that I steal from people? Doesn't he know what I do? And I can see Zacchaeus just trying to smile with those thoughts. Yeah, don't worry about it. Sit down. Have a good time. You know those people that come over and you're like, really? Mm, you just got to be nice because you want to be Christian and Christ-like and you don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. And you're just smiling. No, wish they would leave. You know? And I can see Zacchaeus trying to smile with these thoughts going on while being in the presence of Jesus but not really being able to enjoy the presence of Jesus because of all this sin and all these thoughts and all this weight and all this luggage that he's saying, doesn't he know that I steal from people? But then I can flip the script and imagine listening in on the thoughts of Jesus. What was Jesus thinking of Zacchaeus? It's probably something like this. Zach, buddy, you think I'm bothered by you? You think that I'm repelled by your sin? You're not even really that good of a thief. Like, you're a small-time thief. See, Zach, you need to understand who I am. I'm about to pull off the greatest heist in history. I'm about to rob death of its sting. I'm about to rob all of humanity of sin, past, present, and future. You don't have to come to, into my presence and be insecure. You need to understand that I came for you. I'm compelled to you. Zacchaeus, you don't need to climb a tree just to see me or watch me from a distance because I'm about to climb a tree that will destroy the divide forever. Could you imagine the thoughts that were taking place? See, some are here this morning and think that because of the mistakes and the sin that God doesn't want to come near to you. But you need to understand that you are the very reason why he came to this earth and sacrificed his life. So when you come into this place of worship, you don't have to feel less than or you don't have to feel worthless because of sin. You can find your worth in Jesus. Look, we don't want you just to be here, just to be in the presence of God. We want you to enjoy being in the presence of God. God wants to forgive you so that you can worship freely and so that you can live freely in your life. See, the Bible says that Zacchaeus, after being with Jesus, after experiencing his presence, that he no longer took advantage of people. That he turned from his sin. He turned. He had to turn from it. And he was forever changed after one encounter with Jesus. Look, a true understanding of your worth in Christ makes you not want to sin anymore. I remember I was at the mall one time. I'm a people watcher. So if I'm ever staring at you, just bear with me, okay? <laughs> I'm a people watcher, and so 
I remember I was at the mall, and I was sitting in one of those little sitting sections, you know, because my wife was running around shopping. I was like, oh, I already found what I wanted, and I was good. And so 30 minutes turned into three hours somehow. And this man came up, and he was sitting in one of the chairs, and he had an oxygen tank that he was dragging behind him. And he sat there, and I was just looking at him, watching him, and he looked frail, and he looked broken, and he would have to pick up this little mask and breathe and breathe, and then I was like, man, I feel so bad. I get broken for that, and so I walked outside, and he come following 10 minutes later. I'm like, is this guy following me? Am I going to have to jack up a dude with oxygen tank? That'd be real bad. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I'm sitting on the bench outside, and he sits right next to me, and he lights a cigarette. I'm like, oh, thanks, buddy. You know? <laughs> but what caught me was in between every inhalation of that cigarette he had to put oxygen back on just to breathe and it did something inside of me and God was speaking to me in this moment the cigarette stick that he had in his hand like he needed this oxygen oxygen to breathe he needed oxygen so that he wouldn't die but the thing that he was holding in the other the other hand was what was causing him to need the oxygen the very thing that he was inhaling was the very thing that was killing him See, some of us know what we're dealing with is wrong, and so we come to church for a little breath, for a little oxygen, so that we can breathe again, that we can make it through our day, but we leave and we pick up our stick again. And we don't turn. And I'm not here to attack. I'm just here to say, here's a, here's a lesson for us, is that God is saying when you come to church or you're at home or you're in your car and you ask for forgiveness, wherever you may be, that we have to turn away from that thing that's holding us down. That's true forgiveness. We keep hearing the word, but we keep picking back up the thing that we have a problem with, and we wonder why we feel the way that we feel. And every time we do this, we devalue our worth in Christ. Every time we do this, we devalue what Christ has done for us. Look, I want someone to know this morning that despite what it looks like, despite what it feels like, that you can be forgiven. It's not too big for God, and, and you have to give it to him. And the thing is, when you give it to him, that means we have to turn away from it. If there's a sin that you've been dealing with in your life and you ask for forgiveness all the time for that sin, maybe you haven't turned from it. God is saying just turn from it. We have to give it to him and go the other way. You can change. You can be forgiven. The good news is he's already purchased forgiveness for you. As I close this morning, I want to go back to Hebrews, the very first passage we read, full of hope, full of encouragement, full of faith. We read that Christ was the final solution for sin. The final solution that his death was this one-time event and that he doesn't have to keep dying. He doesn't have to keep going to the cross. He doesn't have to keep sacrificing his life. That's how valuable you are. That's how much worth you have. But we have to accept that over our life, especially when things aren't going so well. I know that life is hard. I know that we go through some challenging seasons. I know that sometimes we can't see it. Look, Thomas, he had walked with Jesus. He walked with Jesus in the flesh. He, he experienced the greatest gift that, that God has ever given. The son, of Je the son of God, Jesus Christ, was next to him. He heard all the things that he was saying, but when it got hard, he even doubted. He even had these issues. But Jesus told him that his blessing is far greater for those people that believe even when they can't see. What is that? faith and I believe that he was telling us that we need to trust in him and what he said over our lives and know that he what he has done is available for us too it's easy to believe for someone else but when you go through that season sometimes it's hard I want to end with this story um, I remember and the band can come or somebody play and make me sound better um, I remember my wife Crystal when we were, uh, she was in labor with our first child, Annabella. Um, she was in labor for the max amount. I don't know if it's 12 hours, 10 hours, something like that. And Annabella, 
She just didn't want to come. She didn't want to come out. She was living it up. But she was turned upside down and stuck in the birth canal. And the doctor comes in and he says, look, we're going to have to do an emergency C-section. And so I started freaking out. Crystal started freaking out. We're like, what? And they said, we have to go now or your baby is not going to make it or she's going to deal with a lot of the problems in her life. And I remember they took her away from me and I was like, oh my God. And in that moment, I started freaking out. I was worried. I was doubting. I was like, God, why, why is this happening? And something hit me in my life that God is faithful. I was getting dressed. They put me in this little room, and they said, put all these scrubs on. And I'm like shaking and freaking out. I'm putting them on. And in my spirit, something just saying, God is faithful. God is faithful. And I started accepting this over my life after about 10 minutes of freaking out. You ever been in the freak out moment? Yeah, where you don't have control. You don't know what you're going to do. You just want to like, ah. The doctor kept saying, we need to go now. We need to go now. We need to go now. You need to hurry up. You need to put these scrubs on. And I remember uh, I was finishing getting dressed, and the lady was knocking on the door. Sir, you need to come now. And I'm freaking out for my wife. I'm freaking out for my child. How many know that in moments like this, even when there's fear, even when there's worry and doubt that tries to creep in, that you just have to stop for a moment and know that God is faithful, that he's for you and not against you, that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I started to walk through that deal and I was shaking so bad and I walk in there and Crystal's laying on this operating bed and they have the sheet, you know, and she's looking at me, she's terrified. I felt so helpless because my wife and I just grabbed her hand. I said, Crystal, God is faithful. And did you know that today? Because I accepted the word from myself. There's a 13-year-old redhead. That's probably the most beautiful girl you've ever seen. And if I get emotional and cry, it's okay. Walking around here with no problems, with no birth defects, with no issues, extremely smart, smart. As a matter of fact, she's the vice president of the National Junior Honor Society. And I'm not here to brag on my kid, but you know what? I'm here to brag on God because of her and what he did. Because I accepted this for myself. She's full of life and she's full of God and she doesn't have an issue. So when you see me preaching passionate about this subject, please don't try to kill my vibe because I've learned to accept the word for my life. I've learned to accept the grace of God for my life. It's the very reason why I'm breathing right now. It's the very reason why I stand on this stage right now and have the opportunity and, and the honor to preach the word of God. It's the very reason my child is here. Look, is there anyone in this room that should be worshiping a little bit more because he forgave you when, you, when it didn't seem like you could be forgiven? Maybe you should be lifting your hands a little bit higher when the worship team's trying to lead you into worship because you know that he saved you more, than, more times than you can count. Maybe you shouldn't be here right now, but he got you here and you're full of health and you're full of love and you're full of joy and you're full of the presence of God. And maybe you need to just worship a little bit. Look, I understand that you've dealt with some stuff. I understand that you might have some issues in your life, but please understand that what he accomplished on the cross was a one-time event for you. And he gave you the power to overcome sin and issues and receive forgiveness. That's how much those holes cost him. You're valuable. You have worth. He would do what he said he would do. Believe the word for yourself. Believe the word over your life. He is enough. And no matter what, you need to know that forgiveness is available for you too. Can we pray? Father, I thank you so much for your presence in this place. Lord, I feel you so near. God, I ask that we would understand that you came for us, that we have value, that we have worth, and it doesn't matter what things look like, feel like, what we've been through, what we're going through, but you'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. Your forgiveness is available to us. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to receive forgiveness so that we can have freedom and liberty to know that we're valuable in who you are. Father, I pray that today if anyone is in the room that they're having trouble uh, receiving forgiveness, that you would just make this clear and plain that they can be forgiven by just asking. 
But Lord, let's take it a step further and give us the power to overcome and to turn from those things so that we can walk in freedom forever. Lord, thank you for giving your life for us. And we just praise you this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen.